Yeah, so um, one of the things that we're looking at is the expected climate change that we that you are looking to face in, in the Northwest. Um, and then how that's going to impact on our livestock production in, in those areas. Um, and then look at a few ways that we can adapt to that. So this work sort of come from a mixture of, of previous work that's been done and some work that we're doing at the moment as part of a, um, a project um, funded by the New South Wales government. So the first um, thing I'd just like to, to show is, is, is some of the, I suppose the, the information you've probably seen many versions of this in the past, um, but the, the graph on the left um, is just showing the change in um, average, uh, temperature and, and anomaly um, over time. So, which just clearly shows that from about the 1960s um, across most of Australia, there has been a steady rise in temperature. Um, to accompany this, we've also had um, some change in rainfall patterns, um, and the map on the right shows. Um, some of this. So it shows um, the that particularly in, in southern New South Wales and Victoria, our growing season rainfall, which is we classify as from um, April to October, has been lower um, after in, in the last 20 years um, than um, than um, at, at other times in, in the past. So um, it, it's showing that we're getting this, this move away from this growing season rainfall. Sorry. Okay, um, so one of the things that I wanted to show is that with this increasing temperature, what we're seeing is um, a change in the event. So while the average is creeping up, we're also showing, um, and, and these graphs below us just show uh, the examples of, of the, the heat. Um, so if you can see here, if we're looking 1950 to 1981 is the light orange uh, distribution. Um, if we look at the dark red, which is the 2001 to 2015, we're showing not only that the average is, in, is creeping up, but when you look down here at the extreme end, it shows that we're getting these extreme heat sort of events more often. Um, while at the lower end, we're still not seeing the same um, decreases or decrease at the same magnitude of the cool event. So it's again this flattening and greater distribution in our heat, heat um, that, that we experience. Um, a little bit different with, with uh, minimum temperatures, but a similar sort of trend that it's sort of more, we're, we're getting increasing heat. So one of the questions I was sort of asked to address was um, how um, the extreme conditions that we experienced in 2019, um, how often are we likely to see these con um, conditions in, in, in the future? So um, as you were well aware, the rainfall was the lowest on record through 2019 and the heat was the highest on record across much of the area that, that, that you're looking at there. Um, and how, how can we effectively manage these conditions in the future? So these are the two questions that I'm going to address today. So the first one is about uh, how often these extreme conditions occur. Um, and the second one will be about how we can effectively manage these conditions in the future. So this is um, uh, looking, when we're looking at future climate, the main drivers are differences in temperature, uh, which have shown are due to increase, and changes in rainfall. The rainfall side of it is generally less um, or harder to predict what will actually occur in practice because rainfall is much more variable in nature. Um, so what I've done is I've only shown the predictions out to 2030. Um, these come from the NARCLIM or the New South Wales government's projections here for, for the Northwest region. Um, and what these distributions show here is that we are expecting to see an increase in autumn rainfall, which is very evident um, based on, on 
recent years and, and particularly this year where we're getting sort of these large rainfall events at this time of year. Um, and we're seeing that that will be at the expense of winter rainfall and uh, to some degree uh, summer rainfall and probably early summer rainfall where in this in your region spring rainfall will, will be about um, even over uh, this period. And, and so this 2030 period that they're looking at, they made these projections for, we're already sort of into this period a uh, bit. So it's sort of telling us what we're, we're starting to witness at the moment. Uh, next thing I'd just like to show is the, the future climate uh, projections for temperature. Um, and I'll focus here on extreme heat because the, this is sort of what we experienced um, in 2019. And i um, like to really hone in on, on what we might um, show in the future. So the first thing to note is that the maximum temperature is predicted to rise by about 0.7 degrees by 2030 and by about 2.1 degrees by 27. So this is sort of based on the consensus of, of different approaches. Um, so when you look at that at 2030, uh, in the west of this area, we're looking at say about five to 10 to 10 to 20 additional days over 35 degrees um, where once you move out to 2070 we're looking at over 40 additional days above 35 degrees um, in the west of this area um, and, and a large portion of that area having 30 to 40 additional days above um, 35 degrees so i mean I suppose what that's telling you is we are going to get these heat extremes and these heat extremes which cause us problems with some of our management either through the management of our animals or through um, management of um, our feed supply um, and water availability. Um, so what I've done over the next series of slides is I've just sort of I'm going to focus in on Corindi as, as a specific example um, and just show here this is looking how the average temperature change which is on the y-axis over on the left um, compared to the annual rainfall at the bottom of the graph here. So there are three different time periods here. Um, so we know that there's a generally a, a relationship between average temperature and rainfall. And as rainfall increases, generally we get cooler conditions. Um, so that's a sort of pretty well established relationship. So what we see here is when we've got 1961 to 80, that's sort of the gray at the bottom of the graph. Now, uh, when we look at the next 20 year period in blue, it's the middle line. And when we look at the latest 20 years from 2001 to 2020, we can see that gradually that heat is, um, is increasing, but generally the rainfall um, is staying about the same. So we're, we, we're getting sort of generally the same distribution of rainfall, uh, annual rainfall that we expect um, throughout that period. Uh, and what I've highlighted here is 2019, just to show you that it was by far the hottest and the uh, driest period on record for this site. So when we look forward at, at this Corindi site, what will it look like? So the way that I've chosen to, to um, sort of describe this for you is to try and use a reference site approach. So we're looking by 2050 that the Corindi will on average be about 1.9 degrees uh, warmer than what it currently is. But the average annual rainfall is not really expected to change too much. So what we're looking at is probably just the change in the rainfall distribution. Um, so changing it seasonally and probably changing the way that the events will fall as well. So when we're looking at reference sites for Corindi, we're looking at areas like Bow Desert in Queensland, and Kingaroy in Queensland, down to areas like Maribri, Moree, Gunnedah um, in, in New South Wales. So the, ch the change is going to be somewhere in the middle of those because we have, um, when we're looking at future climates, we, we, we have some uncertainty about exactly what they look like. Like these models only have a certain level of accuracy. Um, and also there's um, also uh, a difference in what we, um, the actions of people. So we don't know exactly what's going to happen as far as emission scenarios go either. Uh, but what I can say is that that's based on um, the consensus of where we're headed at the moment. So what I've done here is I've plotted out the 
2001 to 20 years again and, and 2019 again. So that's the blue at the bottom here and 2019 is the bright yellow dot again. And what I put on here is two of those sites. What was the weather like over the last 20 years for Narrabri and for Kingaroy, just to look at what the potential distribution might be for those. And so what we can see is that clearly there is going to be, uh, particularly if we're looking at, at Narrabri is, is where the weather ends up. Um, there's going to be significant number of years that they're going to be as hot or even hotter than what we experienced in 2019. The rainfall is going to be a little bit harder to predict. So it may be as low um, uh, or even lower, but we, we don't really know um, how often that's going to occur. But we just do know that there will be um, likely to be more lower rainfall events. So when just here, I'll just talk a bit more generally about pasture, the impacts on pasture production over different areas um, of Australia. So there was um, quite a substantial bit of work done um, called the Southern Adaptation Project, where they looked at these areas for a lot of different regions across Southern Australia. So some of the key findings that came out of this was that we're expecting a dry summer period to lengthen, um, which is, and, and this lower pasture production across much of Southern Australia. Um, so the Western areas of New South Wales, so if we're looking on this map, um, that, that those uh, are often the most red areas. So what we're looking at here, this figure on the right, is a series of, of, of four models uh, of future climate and how they'll, the variation in how they might impact pasture production. And then if we look at the bottom line, that is the um, mean of those four models. So that's probably a consensus about where we might end up. Um, and what it shows is um, most of those areas are looking at sort of um, in, in Western New South Wales uh, or West of the Divide, we're looking at a drop in production um, by 2050 and 2070, somewhere in the order of 25% or more. While across the whole um, area, say by uh, 2030, we're looking at 9% production, by 2050, a 7% production, and by 2070, a 14% production uh, reduction. So you can see that um, uh, the areas sort of west of the Great Dividing Range in New South Wales are likely to have a bigger impact than, than other areas in southern Australia. So this same um, work then followed that production through to operating profit of livestock systems. So here we can look at um, some of the impacts on these livestock production systems here. Um, and one of the clear things is if we don't change the systems and we run them as we currently, uh, our average systems are currently run, there's going to be a substantial impact on, on profit. Um, and where the pasture production is most impacted, these are the areas that are going to have the, the largest impacts on, on, um, on profitability. So when we're looking across this whole area, by 2030, we're looking at an average reduction in profit of about 27%, 32% by 2050, and 48% by 2070. So that's if we continue to operate our systems as the typical systems that they looked at when they started this project. So uh, there, there is clear need to adapt our systems. Um, otherwise, uh, there is um, going to be some large impacts on, on operating profit. So just coming back to this um, uh, example at Crendi, um, what I've shown here is again, just the historic uh, average green dry matter. So this is just sort of the, the green component of the pasture that we expect from a from a perennial pasture that has a legume component and um, a winter growing perennial. So I haven't, I've just used a generic one in this modelling um, rather than a specific species, but just saying something like could be a winter um, growing native species or it could be a growing species as an example. And what we can see is when we use the uh, 2050 data from 
Narrabri uh, as, as the example. So that's our reference site. So we're saying that Corindai now looks like, um, uh, by 2050, looks like what Narrabri does now. Um, and this shows the reduction in profit that we um, are, are expecting. Uh, oh, sorry, in, in, in partial production that we're expecting to see. Um, if we also consider that, because these models don't model persistence at all, um, then we can see that there's, um, there's also a further reduction in, in the partial production. So if we look at these again, at what this means for, for animal requirements. So this is the average level of supplement intake per and once we look at that narrow bra, we can see that there's an average increase in that supplement intake that would be required. But if our legumes fail, then there's going to be a much greater impact um, on feed availability. So there's a few things that are going on. So this is what I'm looking at here. This is just some work that we've done showing uh, legume persistence and so uh, and and perennial persistence. So I'll just focus on manual legumes here. Um, which is this graph here. Um, what it shows is these are some sites across um, across New South Wales and what we would expect the conditions to be experienced for legume seed set, which is one of the key traits for uh, legume persistence. And it shows that there's, there's most areas are sort of where we commonly find sort of annual legumes uh, as a base and the seed base, they're around that 0.7 to 1 rating one is ideal conditions um, most of the time where 0.7 is, is the sum constraint. If you look at um, Corindai in the 2001 to 2020, it's, it falls in, in that uh, 0.7 range. But if we're looking at Narrabri as being the future, then there's gonna be a decrease in that median um, uh, temperature period, uh, sorry, um, sorry, rainfall through that, that period which means that the seed set um, is going to decrease. So these annual legumes are going to be less reliable um, through this period. Um, so one of the other things that we're looking at is the um, impact of heat stress. And one of the key things that we, if we're looking at um, a summer joining, then there's likely to be a greater impact on reproduction from heat stress. So I won't go into this in detail because it's running out a little bit of time. So when we're looking at adaptation options, what can we do? Um, some of the things that we've been shown is to increase soil fertility on the feed base side, adding loosen to pastures because of that, it's able to access moisture from depth and confining feeding um, over summer to protect pasture. Um, have all shown to be um, positive impacts on um, the increases in, and these optimal systems have been shown that they can actually increase profit by 70% in 2030 and 2050 uh, and even 50% by 2070. So if we do things well um, based on the adaptations, we can actually improve the productivity even under future climates. Uh, and so this, and these things are associated with current best practice. One of the things to take into account, these don't take into account changes in partial composition and they don't take into account the heat stress effect. So some of the adaptations with, um, with partial, if we're looking at, um, this is our current partial that I showed before and um, uh, the impact under heat future climate. If we add a, um, tropical perennial grass, then what it shows is it increases with an annual legume and it increases our impact over um, a feed availability throughout the year. And that's even under current conditions, which is the blue line I've just put up there now. We might have to change our annual legume to a species that's better adapted to more um, arid environments. So this might be a move to a snail medic or a barrel medic as an example. Um, and so when we're looking at these options, uh, this is the current level of feeding. Um, if we introduce this C4 grass, um, even under future climate, it's going to reduce the level of feeding of our, of our animals. Um, so introducing tropical grass looks like a really sensible option um, in this part of the world and, and is, has already been adopted widely across the, the north. 
Tell me how that patient option is for heat stress. I won't go into this in detail, but just shows that here the, the heat stress is shown on these maps based on historic data. If we're joining in February for sheep here at this example, um, there's a much greater chance of stress if, we, um, if, if we're joining in February. But simply by moving those joinings to November and April, we can overcome some of those. But we might have some other issues around the feed availability that we have to manage if we do that. Providing shade might also be another example. There's still not a lot of good uh, evidence for that. So just summing up the impacts, um, temperatures will increase uh, and extreme events will decrease pasture production. Uh, the persistence of some of the annual legumes and so on temperate grasses will decrease, uh, further reducing production. There'll be feed deficits for animal production uh, with increasing supplements or reduced stocking rates. And we might have heat stress as an issue in, in certain systems. So what this will do is decrease our profits um, if we need to make some changes. Um, on the feed best side, um, introducing tropical pastures will increase pasture availability um, and make use of that increasing autumn rainfall. So that's one of the key advantages there. One of the other things that the advantages over tropical grasses compared to loosen is the potential to increase intake with severe summer storms. And some recent work has shown that that's been a massive advantage. Uh, change in legume species uh, for those that are more adapted to arid environments. Um, and we'll probably have to look at more, uh, an increase in forage conservation to overcome those gaps. Um, with animal production, changing breeds and genetics um, potentially is an option, uh, adjusting joining times, optimising the stocking rates, um, and then also some tactical reductions in stocking rate, whether that's in the feedlots to target feeding or whether it's um, uh, using trading as an example to, to adjust the stocking rate. But what some of the... Uh, so Upside is that adopting current breast practice can increase profits even under future climate predictions. And there's also many adaptation options that you can take and you need to tailor those to your system. So how often will extreme events convert occur? I think we're showing that the heat will occur much more often, but the rainfall, we're uncertain about how often that will occur. But I'm pretty sure we can I uh, guarantee that the, the drier conditions will come more frequently. You can effectively manage these conditions by understanding your environment and look to the adaptations needed from a reference site is a good way to visualise what changes are needed. Uh, we're making strategic changes, e.g. sowing a long-term pasture, understand what works now and what is likely to work in the future. Um, and best practice options that are available now will help maintain profitability into the future. So that's all I've got. Thank you. Thank you.